Hello, everybody. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you all came this evening for what's surely going to be a really great and fruitful discussion with Cole Worthy, the designer of the three games you see seated foreshadowing on this table here of the events to come. And we are here. The title of this event is Textures and Pl Textures of Play, and we're here to talk about board games as physical objects. Ones that can often be in service of really complex arguments, ideas, intentions uh, on the part of their designers. Um, the table game industry is large. It encompasses much more than board games. Um, so there are varying estimates for how big this industry is, but Florida's estimates are around $26 billion, or, which makes it roughly equal to the global music industry in size. Um, that's partly because if you look at tabletop gaming, it encompasses a lot of things, a lot of things from role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, card based games like Magic the Gathering, and miniatures based games. But what we're focusing on today is board game, which is its own sort of thumb with many little sections of the others, and representing a lot of different potential experiences uh, that its players seek out. Now, I don't want this talk to be a history lecture about board gaming, but I do want to introduce a couple of sort of moments in the history of gaming, specifically the history of hobby gaming, the emergence of a market for board games, and other types of tabletop games that were not aimed necessarily at a general family audience. They're not necessarily intended to be sold in large numbers at a, at a department store, but they're created by people for a small group, an already small group of people, usually adults, who understand what they want in a game, who have a particular idea of the sort of games they want to play. And we usually say this um, sort of particular community of games that really begins to pick up in the mid-50s with the emergence of mass market numbers of games like outside of the military, like war games. So games meant to simulate that. Uh, usually between two players. The war game community emerges in the late 1950s, picks up during the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and there are other um, instances of board game series usually aimed at adults, like three hours bookshelf game series, of which the most well known example now is Acquire, uh, which has been reproduced in its now third or fourth edition. Um, so from the war game community emerged in the mid 70s, the role playing genre, like Dungeons and Dragons, which were invented by a group of war gamers operating in the Midwest. Uh, and from there, things pick up. The market for hobby games start to pick up in the States and also in Europe. Uh, what's important that happens in Europe in the late 70s and to the early 90s is the sort of pioneering of an infrastructure for recognizing board games as, if not a part form, but at least an authored product. An ideological product. So, 1979, the Spiel des Jahres, the the game prize, essentially in German, was established, and this was a consortium of critics and authors saying, you know what, we can't judge the best family games that are coming out, and we'll pick one and say this is the best of its time, and this was a new form of recognition of board games. The first example to win the Spiel des Jahres is this game at the bar. An English hare and tortoise. In German, it's hare and hedgehog. But it's meant to, it's a racing game replicating the Aesop's fable. Uh, it's actually authored by a British designer, David Harlot. Um, also in Germany, the first really dedicated tabletop games fair, the Bachmann's Fair, emerged in 1983. And also in Germany, we see the push for board game authors and designers to have their name on the box so that people know who made these games. So usually if you go to Monopoly and buy a Monopoly box, that will not say Clarence Darrow patented this game in the 1930s. It will just say Monopoly. Other forms of tabletop games that were in the 80s and 90s was miniature games with Warhammer and collectible card games with Magic the Gathering. Things also began to intensify when in 1995 this game called Settlers of Catan, a German game by Klaus Teuber is published, and goes viral, essentially. It reaches a success unseen 
preparation for uh, contemporary uh, for hobby games up to that time, and it continues to sell in the millions, uh, far outnumbering many other in its genre. And this begins a very fruitful exchange in the late 90s into the early 2000s among uh, European and American designers. And then the internet actually helps out a lot. So one thing that's often fascinating is that the video game and industry and the rise of the internet did not kill tabletop gaming. It actually has been very fruitfully entwined throughout, uh, throughout the decades, in part because the internet allows board game enthusiasts to find each other. And then I would like to point out that the phase that Cole is working in, that these games are operating in starting in around 2010, is even more closely interrelated with the internet. Uh, the sort of main source for funding for many new board games, especially from indie publishers, is through Kickstarter and crowdfunding sites. Uh, and so, uh, just to show you the extent to which crowdfunding for board games uh, is such an important funding mechanism, there are around 3,000 new tabletop Kickstarters every year. Uh, in 2021, it raised, uh, tabletop Kickstarters raised $242 million dollars which is about 10 times the amount of Kickstarters among via video game Kickstarters. So the interrelationship between crowdfunding and the tabletop industry is extremely tight. Uh, and we also uh, see uh, the rise of digital tools, digital arenas for playing games, board games digitally, which actually tends to very fruitfully feed back into purchasing actual physical examples. So that's often a very to change of people who encounter games first digitally than buy the physical copy or vice versa. And they enjoy the physical game so much, they start playing the digital one. Um, so what we've ended up with at this stage, there will be three games published in the past three years. It's a wide diversity of materiality, of physical appearance, of recent materials, ranging from simple information-driven aesthetic of war games to a sort of game that tries to meld game as a board game with very rich materials meant to really put you in the sense of the narrative. Um, and these games can use a variety of materials to touch uh, the eye and to immerse the play. And that is sort of the material world in which Cole Worley stepped in these games that he has designed. Uh, Cole Worley is the creative director of later games and the co-founder with his brother Drew of Whirly Good Games, um, which was founded in 2018, and its very first name is actually Pac-Man Second Edition, which you see on the right. Um, he has an MA and PhD in English from UT Austin, and his doctoral work dealt with imperialism and imperial imaginings in Britain in the early 19th century, and that actually has informed many of his designs. Um, including a PAX Premier. Uh, so we will be talking about three games that he designed that you see here. Um, and we are basically, we'll be asking questions about the materiality of these games through these sort of three major questions. Uh, why choose to explore a concept, an idea, a narrative, a story, a historical moment by means of a board game as opposed to other media? What variables do designers consider as they make decisions about the materiality of their games? And to what degree can a designer control or shape the experience of a game through material choices? And the three games we'll, we will be talking about are perhaps to your second edition, a game in which you play as Afghani uh, rulers in the 1820s and 30s, uh, trying to use the attempts by Russian and British imperialists to exert control in the country for your own purposes. Oath, an allegorical game in which one plays uh, sort of social figures, exiles, chancellors, citizens, uh, trying to build a story about a, a, a sort of people's generation via generation over several games. And John Company, which is a game in which you play as families using the British East India Company to uh, promote your own social standing. And it's made to sort of the British East India Company is a collective of individuals all working in, on their own intentions for their own purposes. 
but collectively their actions lead to the actions of what we call the British East India Company. So with that, we'd like to invite Cole World Worley up here. Uh, Premier, I'll say a few things about the creation of Premier uh, that will maybe provide a little bit of context. Um, Premier was originally published by a company uh, called Sierra Madre Games, run out of Germany, and they published historical games at a time when it was slightly unfashionable to publish historical games on lesser recorded subjects. Most historical games tended to cover the Civil War or the Second World War, periods that don't hardly need covering. Uh, in order to make their business model work, they produced games in a very small format, a four inch by four inch square box. Uh, they could weigh no more than a kilogram. And these games had these very um, humble productions, primarily to take advantage of breaks in the German postage rates. Uh, it was cheaper to send them. And so whenever you were working on a game for Sierra Madre, you always had to work with very strict material constraints. Now, when the rights to the, those initial history games that I had done, when they reverted back to me, um, I looked at the original designs and realized this was not how these games should properly be presented. Uh, if we're working on a, a project together, I don't want it to be informed by the German postal system. And so we thought a little bit about what Pamir should look like as a game. Actually, can you hand me that lid? Um, Which one? The rules? Just the lid. Just the lid. Okay. I got it. Uh, so this is the cover of the second edition of, of Pax Premier, and the format, the form factor of this box is what's called a bookcase style box. Um, those early war games, the Avalon Hill games and the 3M games, which you alluded to in the introduction, use this same format. So it's an old and important box size uh, in the history of gaming. We also wanted to feature a, a spine. This is a way, by the way, that um, games in the 50s and 60s uh, fought for respectability on your shelves. They looked like a they looked like a book, and the fight is not over, as you can see. Um, so it really started here, and so we thought, okay, well, if we have the real estate, the volume of this box, what can we do to sort of make it lovely? And one of the things that we did is we decided to deck it out with with period art in every place that we can. So when someone opens up the box for the first time, the first thing they're going to see is the inside of the box, which is this uh, lithograph by I think Atkinson. Uh, part of a series of lithographs done on the occasion of the first Anglo-Afghan War. Mm -hmm. um, many of the officers in, in the army had artistic training, and, and when they got home, they published books that were just filled with all of their illustrations and incidentals. So using those illustrations, we tried to paper over as much, not paper over, but we tried to use those illustrations to form the kind of background, the kind of texture of the game. Mm -hmm. And this, is this also one yep. of these examples? So yes, yes this is... A car, basically a space for cards that yep. form the market for this game. So you can see also. And there, there's, a, there's a small material element that can be emphasized with this as well. So when you're playing this game, uh, it's a game played with playing cards. Now, usually when you play a game with cards, they're going to be sitting on a table. The problem is if you're managing your own player area, uh, and then every player has their own player area where they're playing cards, you can imagine... Um, I don't know, something like, do yeah, we can, we can put, put out some cards. Uh, part of the problem with working on cards, oh, you Let's know see. what? Uh, Exposure is a little high. Okay. You can kill the light. Kill the light. Oh, no, that's still... That's worse. That's worse. Um, yeah, I, I have an idea. Let's, let's just back it up just slightly. Okay. Uh, well, we'll not worry about, we'll not worry about cards. Okay. Okay. In the meantime, from a distance, okay. you can see what these cards look like. Excellent. Now, there we go. Uh, perfect. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, so, let me find one that's. In point of fact, we don't actually need to know what is on the card for me to make the, the point I want to make about the cards, which is the problem with cards. Cards are a lovely thing when you're working on a game because they can hold a lot of information, a lot of illustration. Uh, any tool that you can apply in the paper arts, you can apply to a card. But cards are very thin. And so, if we are having player areas with cards, one of the things we realized was if you had certain cards which are held in common, you needed some way to elevate them. So we included this, this board here to act a little bit like a stage. Now it's only about two millimeters tall, but that's enough to create a little bit of visual separation, and I don't know if this will be captured really, from a card that might be sitting on the table. We'll do it like this, look at this, look at me. There we are. So it doesn't look like much here, but it creates a little visual separation, a little bit of a step. So we're always looking for ways to kind of break up the visual space of the game mm -hmm. by using any material that we, we have in the box. Yeah, and it's partially because, I mean, these, a board game 
every component is also a piece of information or an information holder to some degree. You need to always be finding ways to utilize the player's own way of finding information and how they look for information, how they group things mentally and visually in their mind to understand. Well, and, and we ran, you know, when we were determining the graphic design for this project, um, we encountered many essential problems very quickly. One of the biggest ones was we knew that we wanted to use a lot of period art. One of the difficulties with using period art is that period art does not adhere to any kind of graphic hierarchy that a game might want to impose. And so these illustrations are essentially micro collages where we've cut out primary actors from one illustration, we've put them on backgrounds from other illustrations, and in playing with levels of opacity and saturation, we can help use these historic objects to create a visual hierarchy that kind of guides the eye through all the principal components. Now, not all of the pieces of art in the game were uh, taken from, uh, from, fr from the public domain or from archives. Some of them were commissioned and we had to find artists. Um, the icons in the game were drawn uh, by Abul Bahadari, a uh, wonderful Iranian artist who, um, or an artist of Iranian descent, who did uh, fantastic work trying to create essentially etchings that would capture the, uh, so the fear. These sort of symbols here, right? Yeah. And here. There we are. Uh, now, the cards are only one part of the game's visual language. Um, and we wanted to be careful in thinking about how we wanted players to immerse themselves in the period and what art notes they could be taking, um, or what notes from the game's aesthetic design they would be using to immerse themselves. So the primary um, surface of play is this mat here. This mat sort of, it's a map of the region, Central Asia. Um, it's, it's a bit of a funny map. It's a map that you would have a hard time overlaying on something like Google Maps. Uh, but it's a map that would make sense to the political actors in the space of the game because it highlights the critical series, uh, the critical regions and cities and their connections with one another. Yeah. Now, the map is a cloth, uh, and it was actually produced at a factory that primarily produces place mats um, because we wanted something we wanted something thick. When you ask for something to be printed, usually the, the techniques for printing on fabric are going to produce crystal clear images because they're they're wanting to like put a family photo on like a stretch a stretch fabric or something, which is not what we wanted. We wanted a coarser weave, uh, and and what we were looking for primarily. So you can see the weave here. What we were looking for primarily was to establish a certain. Um, a certain direction that hinted at uh, Persian and North Indian um, courtly games. So we were looking at uh, early f uh, forerunners to games like Ludo and Parcheesi, uh, things like um, you know games that we might know uh, here, Snakes and Ladders. Many of these games were played on wooden tables or on stone tables uh, or stone boards or on cloth mats. Uh, and the pieces themselves were often uh, a lacquered wood or, or stone. So to help work that out, uh, we decided to use resin as the game's primary material. Now, resin is an interesting um, material to work with because you have a lot of control over its feel based on the chemical properties of the resin that you're working on. So when we say resin, we really mean lots of different things, of course. Uh, but with these pieces, uh, they have a, a chalky texture to them. That chalky texture is created by lowering the amount of silicone that's in the resin. The higher the silicone, the rubber, rubbery or the smoother it'll be. But this gave them the feeling of, of a stone. And you can hear, see, look at this. Ah, pleasant clack. Uh, you want me to pass them around? Yeah, you can pass them yeah, around. That's fine. Here, yeah, if you would like to. Can I toss you one? All right. Can I sh um, uh, one other, one other note about resin is uh, there are some important production constraints when you're working with resin. It's not like an injection mold. So resin pieces are cast in something that looks a little bit like an ice cube tray. And so you will pour the resin into an ice cube tray. And then once it sets, you can pop out the pieces. But that means one surface of the resin always has to be completely flat without ornamentation. You can see that. No design could be right there. Uh, whereas the other side, of course, can have a, can have a design. Uh, but that didn't matter very much because we designed these pieces to not need all six surfaces of, of the piece. But one advantage to resin is the molds are fairly cheap. It's easy to have lots of variations. 
in the design among the pieces. And resin also is, if you're working in um, a chalkier mix of resin, the lower silicon mix, there are routinely imperfections in the pieces. And this is actually a good thing because it means that in the shipping of the game, naturally the pieces are going to chip, they're going to be imperfectly cast, and every set of the game is going to have a slightly different texture mm -hmm. and feel. I think one thing that's also very impressive about these is they tell a lot of information. They technically can convey two very different things depending on whether they're oriented upwards or whether they're laid across the border. So they're meant to be either armies when they're in, sort of in a region or a road. So the fact that they're these like interesting elongated shapes really make it make them active part pieces. They aren't just sort of a pawn to represent, you know, one dollar there. Right. They're conveying multiple things. And that, that was something that we knew very early on we wanted in the game's physical componentry. We we knew that the pieces had to be basically this shape. They had to be these kind of long rectangular prisms. The shape, by the way, for prototyping purposes, it's the size of two standard D6s and win, uh, or, or a six-sided dice. And in order to prototype them, we just glued a bunch together and spray painted <laughs> them because, because we wanted about that weight and about that sound. Um, and I think, you know, I spent a lot of time, we spent a lot of time thinking about the sound the pieces make when they're in the box, when they're placed on the, on the table, on the board. Uh, in the same way that, you know, if you, if you play chess, you know that certain chess sets have a better sound than others, right? And so we try to be very attentive to the sonics of the game. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, if we're talking about the sonics of the game, we should talk about the way the coins work. Yes. Um, Pax Premier uses a set of uh, historic coins, which I'll let you frame however you'd like. Um, these coins are handled quite a bit in the game. Uh, they represent not just currency, but political capital. And because political capital is so often zero sum, uh, they move around a lot between the players. So if one player happens to be rich, as I was last night when we played, Nicholas, um, <laughs> other players are poor. Uh, and, we, so. yeah, and, and when you spend them, you end up giving them to the other players. So they're something that is moved around a lot, and there aren't very many of them. Now, this was to represent a few elements of the Afghan economy in the late 18th and early 19th century, which is that you don't have a lot of specie in, in circulation. Uh, not very, not many coins were were minted at the period. Much of the currency came from northern India or from Persia that was taken at various points or na naturally flowed into to the country. And once there, it moves around. Uh, and so, uh, whenever when we were selecting the coin, uh, we had a lot of debate about which coin we should use because, in point of fact. All of these coins, uh, which only represent one coin in, in the game's currency, could have been different images. But it turns out that was much too confusing for players, so we had to make some, uh, some uh, you know, concession there. But this coin um, is a coin from 1803 that was minted by uh, one of the game's primary actors during his very brief first reign, uh, and he minted it to show everybody that he was the undisputed emperor of Afghanistan at a time when the Durrani dynasty was in free collapse and he was deposed very shortly after. And yet the coins remain in circulation for 20, for 30 years. They would have been coins that would have been in circulation during the time of the game's action, even though they were a remnant of a regime that no longer existed in any practical way. So as a coin, it seemed fitting for what the game was going to be about. Now, one thing I like about um, coins from Central Asia is they don't have rims often, the way they're stamped. And that means that they tend to slide very imperfectly. Uh, but that's perfect for how they operate in the game. You want the games to be piling up sort of freely and sliding around a little bit. You don't need players counting exact numbers, although many players will. Um, and oftentimes they kind of move around in little piles. So we wanted coins that compose themselves nicely in piles. And when we get to Oath, we'll talk about coins that do not pile for, for other reasons. <laughs> So is that a reason to transfer to Oath? We, we can talk about Oath, sure. Yeah. Well, let's do it. Yeah. Which is a completely different project because this is a lot of the materiality, a lot of the imagery, the choice of uh, sort of texture, and everything is meant to refer to a historical moment. But Oath is a complete fantasy world. A completely different thing, yes. Um, I'll, I'll say, actually, while you're packing up, I'll talk just a little bit about um, the presentation of the rules and of the game. So. We're talking here about the game's materiality. And in fact, that's mostly what we're going to be talking about. But of course, a game is fundamentally a set of rules. 
And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how those rules present themselves. So here, for instance, is the rule book for the first, um, for this edition of Premiere. Um, and we tried in the typesetting of these rules to pay attention to uh, period appropriate fonts and art, et cetera. Um, but also when you're trying to present the rules, you have to be thinking not just in terms of a, a pretty picture or, um, or a page count or anything like that, but also a spread. So rule books are composed of spreads. This is a, of course, any book is composed of spreads. Here's a spread, key terms and concepts. But that means when we're designing a game, I have to think about not having another key term that's going to force this into, into four, into two, two spreads instead of one. Um, I'll show you here, for example, the, the general rules and the sequence of play. You know, as we go through uh, game design, I find myself earlier and earlier in the process thinking about how the rules are going to compose themselves on the page, and then that starts informing how the design looks. Now, this rule book is not just the rules for the game. I know that though everyone is a huge fan and grew up playing you know, schoolyard games about 1820s Afghanistan, um, <laughs> that for, for some people, this is their first experience with the period. Uh, and so we always try to include a lot of good background material. So the cards in the game are filled with um, what might get called uh, derisively flavor text. They're actually more like historical footnotes mm -hmm. that tell you about the different characters of the game. And then uh, at the end of every game, we always include a design history section, which talks about how the game was made. And then on the last page, a reading guide. This is Reading the Great Game, which walks players through uh, a kind of list for further reading, as well as some light notes of context that will help them dig digest that, that form of reading. You know, one problem with the subject of the Great Game of, of Central Asia in the 19th century is that it's a very easy period to misread. It's, it's very easy to kind of like backwards project the, the Cold War onto it. And so to avoid that, I wanted to write, not, not just give players a bibliography, but actually give them a little essay that says, look, you know, you should all read Peter Hopkirk's The Great Game, but you should know it was written during the Cold War. And so if it seems a little bit like a Victorian James Bond, it's because that was in the air a little bit. And so it's, you want to put these things in their proper, proper context. Oh, this is for you. Um, <laughs> Fine. Okay, uh, so we can go to Oath. Oath, which completely different aesthetic. And the aesthetic is in part because this is an instance where you have essentially a, a partnership enduring for many, many years between the publisher later games, you, and the artist, Kyle Farron. And it, it becomes a sort of later games aesthetic. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'll just tip this up. Or I'll take this up. So I'll, I'll say a couple things about the creation of these games. I mean, it's really quite hard to talk about what they are without um, saying how they began. So Oath began, um, so o Oath was built at Leader Games. Now, these history games are extensions of a lot of the work that I did as a graduate student, as a young academic, uh, and they are, they are love letters to these subjects. Uh, they involve a lot of research and they take a lot of time to make. Premiere took about three or four years to do its research, John Company about a decade. Oath is a very different thing. It took a long time to make, but it was made by a staff of people, essentially. Um, we have, uh, at Leader Games, a staff of about 15 employees. The creative team is about six. Uh, and this was a product that we did for two or three years. And the conceit of this game is uh, we, had, we had published this game, Root, which had done quite well. And one thing I noticed about players when they talked about Root is that they would talk about their games in sequence. So they would say, oh, I was winning a bunch of games of Root, and then my reign was over, and somebody else started winning games of Root. And I thought, how odd, because that's not how Root works. Root always happens in one moment. You can keep replaying it, but it's not sequential. It's not telling a, a generational story. And that sort of planted the seed of a, what I thought was a very simple idea, which is, what if the end state of a game was also the beginning state of a game? Now, in my experience as a historian, in the sense that, you know, in the minor sense that I try to pretend to be one, um, I knew that history operates on this generational scale, that we tell stories over a, long, over a long period of time. And what we think of as historic narratives is a little bit of an optical illusion. It happens when you back up at a certain distance. And games don't do that, because games end, and then you put away the pieces and everything stops. And in fact, games almost can't start uh, where they finish. If you think about um, games kind of broadly fall into two categories. Some are uh, little entropy engines like chess. You have all this energy on the board, the potential moves of all your pieces. But as you play chess, 
your pieces get tired, they get captured, they get stuck in a corner, that you run out of possible moves. And at the end of a game of chess, there's hardly any energy left in that system. So you couldn't start another game of chess on the ruins of your previous game of chess. There'd be no energy to it. Um, on the other hand, other games are generative. If you've ever played a game of Settlers of Catan, you might have found yourself wishing that you had one more turn. But of course, if you had one more turn, you would have infinite resources because the game is spiraling out of control by the end of the game. And so I sort of had a very simple question which I asked the team, which is what would it look like to build a game where the end state was also the start state? So if you won the game by doing something horrible and tearing down the world, the next game you would have to play in that world that you just made. And it might cause the players to reevaluate what, how they think about victory, to reevaluate some of the decisions they make in the final stages of a game. So that began a very long process, which I could talk about really for hours and hours and hours, and I won't. Um, but it led to the creation of Oath. Now, Oath is a game that we thought a lot about the aesthetic design of this game because we wanted to design a game that could tell these big generational stories. But that meant establishing a look for the game that allowed um, different levels of cultural expression, technological expression, um, modes of being to coexist without seeming anachronistic. Because when you walk down a street in New York, you're gonna see a church that might be a couple hundred years old next to a gaudy condo that just got put up. And they sit there and they might look a little jarring, but they're existing, they're sharing a present. So we had to establish a look for the game that allowed for a very capacious present. Um, so that started really with the art design, which I'll just kind of hint at here. Uh, oh, and actually you can see it here. If you just don't look at these, at the, at the kind of cards and the way um, the, the pieces look. Um, yeah, I think we might be blocking it. Oh, well that's... <laughs> but we'll, we'll put some out. I'll, I'll put some out here. Um, when we were working on the art design for the game, uh, we very qu pretty quickly settled onto an art design, um, which we lovingly called um, the Black Cauldron by way of Jim Henson. Um, <laughs> because what we found was a kind of low fantasy approach that was a, a slightly Muppety, slightly cartoony, gave us actually a lot of room for having different styles of art, different kinds of things within the space of the game that didn't, that didn't jar it with one another. Um, but then we had this problem where the palette of the game uh, very focused in the primary colors, very saturated, um, could be uh, visually jarring. So to get around that, it, we decided, instead of just having players play the cards on whatever tablecloth they might have, not everyone has a lovely, neutral, black tablecloth, um, so we gave them one. Uh, and so this here is a tablecloth. I'll just kind of put it out here. Um, and it's, it's uh, printed on a neoprene mat. Uh, it has this nice gradient on it, a gradient that is designed, and actually we can drop it right here, a gradient that is designed to complement the illustrations uh, that Kyle did for, for the cards. Uh, this had a lovely follow-on effect that we hadn't planned, which is that if you were to use your phone to take a picture of these cards, especially Apple phones, they love to boost the blues and reds. And so it just makes it look like the game is glowing. And we did not have an agreement with Apple, but it just, every single <laughs> image of this game looks more beautiful than it looks in, in, in person. Now, these uh, pieces help form the space of play, and they also do that with, let's see if I can grab some of these. With these sight cards, I'll put a couple on the board here. Here's a, a space of play. Actually, we'll do that one, it's nicer. Um, Here's another one. These can go out here. There we are. Now, visually, it's beautiful, but it's also very noisy. This is an expensive thing when it comes to the visuals of a game. When we're working on a game, we oftentimes think about our budgets. Uh, and the most important budget is what we might call the complexity budget. You know, we, our games are expensive. They take a long time to learn. Um, but we really do try to make them not too difficult to learn. And so if I want to have an intricate, you know, system for valuing wool in the game, I know that it's going to come at the expense of some other system. And that's also true of a game's visual language. Uh, the more colors we're spending here, the more line work we're spending here, the less we can spend in other places. So when it came time to design the game's playing pieces, 
we opted for simple shapes uh, that emphasized a kind of kind of primitive expressiveness that got at something in the game. Or kind of was player about words. Sure. Uh, and then what these characters are meant to model, and I'll use our blue-eyed fellow there, uh, this illustration sort of is then reduced to its kind of primitive, for its primitive form, just in terms of like the number of vertices. And so I, we had a rule whenever we were looking at these wooden shapes where I would tell the artist, we need half as many vertices. We need to go even lower resolution because we want the pieces to seem like they belong in the world that the game is showing. So the artist likes, likes to call this move a uh, kind of deco-rationalism. Um, I like thinking about it as an, inter, an intradiegetic logic where the game pieces, the game itself, should look like it can exist in the world that it is itself showing. Um, this is very important because in a lot of board game aesthetic design, you see a reliance on things like video game tropes and video game aesthetics, especially true in miniature games. And that's, of course, the case because many people who sculpt uh, miniatures come from video game sculpting. It's like the same pool of artists who are moving from one field to another. But if we're talking about playing pieces, a miniature is a very unnatural playing piece. It's hard to grab. It's hard to move around. If you compare that to a chess piece, chess pieces are almost designed to be picked up, manipulated. And this piece, we wanted these pieces to be easy to handle, to, to not be trouble if they, if they happen to, to be knocked over or anything like that. Yeah. One thing that interests me about this board, and that immediately makes it different um, from John Company and slightly different as well, from Pax Premier is that it's not trying to be a map. It's trying, I think you call it like a mental landscape. It's trying to represent a sort of space. So let me just hold this up quickly. So that there's these three areas, hinterland, province, and cradle. So that these, these aren't actual like straightforward places you pinpoint on the map. These are places as the people inhabiting this world understand it. Um, and so could you talk a little bit about the sort of map design or like sure. how you sort of tried to visualize the sort so, of imaginary landscape? Well, it actually, it kind of gets back to the very first thing we talked about, which is what a card is and how cards get used. So when we were working on this game, remember that initial conceit was the idea that the game can remember how it was played. The little note that I wrote on my computer screen on a post that I tagged was, Oath needs to remember how it was played. So whenever we were working on the game, I thought, how, how can I get this game to remember how it was played? Well, the biggest thing that I wanted to do was have the board be savable. Now, that's a nightmare, really. Uh, you, we could have little pockets where we're tucking in cards, but then if you roll it funny, they're going to get bent, and you have to roll it wide enough that it's it, horrible. Bad idea. Uh, I could ask players to take pictures with their phone, but now the game takes an hour to set up, and it's confusing, and the picture's grainy, and it's not working in low light. And so what I found myself doing is thinking a little bit about data and how we store data and what cards can store. And one lovely thing about cards is how thin they are. So, and they hold their order. If you have a deck of cards, that's a tremendous amount of data that's just being stored in what are, what's the card and what is its position in the deck. So Oath uses a kind of simple trick. Um, I, I'm going to really mess this up, but we're going to see. because I'm gonna, I want to go, I wanna go wide for a second. So Oath's board, here it is, is actually a line. It's a line that is uh, arranged in three small lines, but it starts in the top right, goes down, goes to the middle, goes down three spots, goes to the far right, and then goes down three spots. And that's a single line, which means if I gave you a deck of nine cards or however many, uh, eight cards rather, you could, I could say, deal these out from the start of the line to the end of the line, and they would hold their position, which is exactly what we do. Uh, when you s save a board, you take all of the sites in the game and you stack them up in a little stack. You put them in this world box, and it's ready. They're there. No matter if this, bo this box can jump around, all you can take it on as many flights as you'd like, it'll be ready. They're going to hold their position. But we also need to remember what is at each site, which is why there are two different sizes of cards. Because if you know, this initiation rite and the vow of silence, if these cards were sitting in the Charming Valley, we could just put them right here, and then I can put another card on top of it. And then when we're laying it out, I know that when we get to this card, 
they're going to array themselves like this. And so it will hold the information. Essentially, it's a single dimensional array. Um, and that allowed the game to save its entire game position in a single stack of cards, right? So this is the way that the design and the aesthetics are kind of very, very tightly melded together. Now, that there are certain things that it can't hold. It can't hold where the player pieces are because it wouldn't pack up so easily. And so one thing that does happen at the end of the game is you remove all the player pieces and then you, you, you essentially start from scratch. Nobody starts with uh, very many player pieces in, in the following game. But we wanted other ways for players to remember how the game was played. And so we included this, this odd book. Uh, let me see if there are any entries filled in this. I stole this copy from the office and I don't know if it got played. Um, but this book's empty, it's exciting. So this is a little record book, which what we did, and I'll, I'll put it here on the screen, is we included these uh, little sheets, these little journal entries, where players could describe how the game ended. Um, and we didn't give them any guidance for how to do this. Uh, and sometimes they let the winner write it. And one family came up to me at a game fair once, and they said they were very mad that their dad was always the one to write it, even when he lost. And so he had a very, a very sarcastic uh, and mean and mean spirited journal about all of his defeats. Um, some people make comments. Some people do paintings in them. Uh, one thing I also wanted to include was uh, a, a kind of in paper, an illustration of a wall. And we did this because it was a way of players recording their dynasties, their, their sequences of wins. And I was thinking about the lists of kings in Egypt and wanting to find players to like, you know, I want them to record that they had a kingdom that lasted eight games in a row and they might've even been in charge of it for a little bit and then their brother took it from them, <laughs> whatnot. Um, and so it was lovely to see this, this object interacted with and it kind of sits, uh, sits in parallel. I'm gonna mention one more thing before we go to the next yeah. game, which is, um, some of the other game materials. So this game also uses resin pieces, which you'll remember have a flat side, these are the cast, but they're books. These are little secrets. They, they, they sit, um, you can make little bookcases with them as some people do. There, there we go. Um, they're bookcases, they're, they're, they're books that also feature um, some, some printing on them, some, some, uh, some gold paint. And then uh, the game uses coins, metal coins, but these coins are designed differently. Uh, they always need to be stacked. It's very important for you to see how tall how many coins people have at every point. So they were designed with ridges so they could be easily stacked. I'll just kind of show those here. Um, and there we are, we had to we design with these funny, these funny chickens. And there's, there's a reason for that, but I, that's not my story to tell. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, and, but these pieces, both of these, uh, the, the sort of color space of these pieces is very muted compared to the player colors. And that's because we want them kind of sitting on top of all the other colors in the game. All right. Should we should we move on? And it's great that you bring up this notion of uh, like trying to allow for almost a dynastic history, mm -hmm. or uh, yeah, for a dynastic history to emerge in these games, because that brings up this notion of sort of continuing family ties, which mm -hmm. I think is also part of John Company, and where you aren't playing as an individual, but as a family with multiple members right. all doing their own thing. So let's. So. Just literally going to put this under the table. We're not going to worry about it. Um, I'll mention another thing about uh, what, while you're packing up, I'll mention a couple things about rules again. Um, this book has, uh, the, uh, Oath has two rule books. One of them is very legalistic and scary, but it's also quite short. It's really only four or five pages long, but it covers everything. Um, th this was because the game changes so much, you need a very quick, easy reference. But then players, as they actually learn the game, use this document, which contains uh, a lot of illustrations that kind of go through everything um, and kind of slowly break down the concepts, the concepts of the game. You know, w one odd thing uh, about, well, actually, uh, bearing the lead, a lot of these designs are counterintuitive, especially people who've played games. And so... One thing that has happened in our approach as we think about introducing people to these designs is we include things like the back piece here, which says the we weird things about Oath, uh, which basically tells players they're about to do something that is a little odd from the games that they might have experienced. And so we spend a lot of time preparing for grounding the game. That's certainly the case with, with John Company. Yeah. Uh, as you say in many times, uh, you like all three of these designs 
force people to act out a role perhaps that they aren't used to, one that involves them often being conniving or they, they form you know, alliances that they are not comfortable with, but they need to in the moment. You know, they, they have to make suboptimal decisions. They have to make dark decisions, you know, because they're, they're dealing with dark times in history as well. Yeah. So I will actually, I'll introduce John Company by way of, well, I'll just, I'll talk, a little, I'll say a quick word about it. Um, so John Company was the game that Drew and I started working on right after Premiere was done. Uh, this is a game that we had been working on for nearly a decade before it was finished. Uh, there was a lot of re uh, primary research that went into it. Uh, but it was also a very difficult project because of its ambition. It covers the history of the East India Company, starting with its unification. Um, there are two East India Companies uh, in the British context. It starts around 1710 and goes all the, all the way to its nationalization collapse in 1857 and 8. Uh, so in order to get that work to work, we had to have a game that could handle uh, a small corporation growing into an extremely large fractious corporation growing into essentially a proxy state that then deregulates and you have a system where it is operating really just as the monopoly of force where the, the different commercial interests are, are private operations and then to its collapse and full nationalization um, under the British government. That's a big subject for a game. It's 150 years of history. It took a lot of time to think about what the proper frame was. Now, the, the core conceit of John Company. So if Oath's core conceit was, how do you build a game that remembers? John Company was, how do you tell the story of an institution? Um, especially an institution like the East India Company, which was strange. Uh, and it was strange because a lot of times when we talk about the British Empire, we like to talk about the kind of high empire, the late 1880s British Empire, because it's so easy to caricature. It's so absurd. It's so ridiculous. It's very easy to talk about because you couldn't teach imperialism in any better way. But the East India Company is peculiar. Uh, it's a reluctantly evil corporation that is nonetheless incredibly evil. Uh, and as we were going through the, the game, it took a while to realize what the essential question of the East India Company was, which is, or not the essential question, the essential vantage point. And that vantage point is to understand the East India Company not as a single actor, but as an actor network as a group of families often operating at cross purposes whose collective actions produce what we know of as the East India Company. And so the John Company is a business game and we've all probably played business games like Monopoly and things like that. But what is different about it is instead of every player being their own corporation, there's just one corporation and all the players are actors, characters in it. On this large illustration at the top, which is the board of the game, you can see a row from the left to the right with these little cameos in it. Yeah. Those cameos are the family members of the players who have influence over the different official positions in the company. Uh, one player might be the wife to the company's current chairman. Another player might be, you know, the, the brother to the director of the trade. Another player might be actually, you know, have a nephew who's the director of its shipping. And these characters, they all hate each other. But they also really need to marry into good families and there's lots of respectability politics at work. And they're doing their best to make their way through the, the kind of high circles of London at the period. Uh, and they're going to use the East India Company as a way to climb socially. So the first thing that we had to do was figure out a basic playing piece that grounded the players in this reality. And we decided to go with these cameos. These were commissioned um, switch to the... by a Polish artist uh, who did a number of... Oh, we need our, we need our camera friend. There we are. Um, so these little cameos here well, um, were, were uh, we had them all commissioned. Uh, there, every player has twenty, and they're all unique. Um, and they are meant to represent the anonymous figures in the company's history. Uh, we didn't want to give them names, although players often give them names anyway. Um, and, and, th and that's fine. Players can give them names. I don't want to give them names. Um, what we wanted to do was to make players realize that the essential atomic playing unit of this game was a person, was a person who had agency, but who had agency within the context of a family. So they couldn't quite decide anything. Um, now this meant, uh, well, I mean, one way to think about it is like, well, you have some options. You, you could take a piece of wood and make it look like a little person outline. 
but that felt too anonymous. And we could use just a, a cube, a uh, classic game component, but that is much too anonymous. Um, and a miniature felt too distant. Pro part of the problem with a miniature in, in a game is that you don't really get to see it up close. It just looks like a blob of, of shape. Um, <laughs> but a cameo is both an object that would have existed. I mean, obviously, these aren't ivory cameos. Um, but these are, these are objects that would have had currency, would have been familiar to people at the, at the, at the time. And we were able to do this because um, technology in screen printing and in heat transfer printing has gotten a lot better in the last five or six years. Now, usually when we do screen printing, uh, you're always having to pay per color. So it's ex exceptionally expensive. Um, but with this game, we actually switched to using heat transfer, which allowed us to much more easily uh, have a different color for every faction that um, corresponded to their primary color. So here's the yellow player, which has a kind of more of a brownish, goldish secondary color. There's also a very useful guarantee against uh, different kinds of color blindness, which is a very important consideration when we're working through uh, these games. So these were the essential, you know, playing pieces. This is what, what you're going to be holding on to. Uh, the other essential playing piece is, of course, the money. Uh, and once again, we had an excuse to mint a bunch of uh, fraudulent coins. So here's some. Um, now, the, we, because John Company deals in a lot of money, you need more than one uh, currency. Yeah, not more than one currency, you need more than one denomination. So John Company has ones and twos. Here are some twos. Uh, and it has, uh, let's see, here are, some, here are the fives. I'm just going to put them all out here in a big pile. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about these coins. Now, part of the problem with doing a game about 150 years of currency is that there's basically, or 150 years of game, is that there's basically no currency outside of a Roman coin or something that was truly in circulation that long. There are examples, but nothing that would have fit this period. Uh, this gave us an excuse to pick very specific historic coins. So, for example, the, the ones are actually pretty close to um, company script. They're called St. Helena Halfpennies, often issued by the company for use for people stationed as company actors to buy from company stores. Uh, the fives are uh, based on oh, spotlight one here. Here's a five. Um, this is a, a Moga Rupee, uh, which is from the mid-19th century. Um, an effort at late East India Company l l legitimacy, minting these very expensive large coins in the subcontinent. Kind of a, a coin of the late company. We wanted to make sure we had one of those. And then my favorite are the tens. So the tens are very large, thick coins. Uh, means that I think in 1747 or so, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, features George II, looking rather regal. Uh, at the bottom, and you can't uh, quite see it, uh, are the letters EIC stamped in the bottom of these coins. Um, and that's, that stands for, as you might guess, the East India Company. Uh, there was a bit of a cash crisis in the middle of the 18th century, and the crown needed money. Uh, and they asked the East India Company, who said they'd be happy to comply, but they had to make sure they stamped any coin they contributed with the company's insignia, which is what they did. Um, so really, this is trivia, but it's trivia that it works at the service of trying to pull the players into its period. And that actually brings me to um, the kind of two registers of the game, which is one of the last kind of major uh, topics that I want to get to, depending on how we're doing on time. So like that. this is a game about a huge subject. And when you're working on a subject this large, you you want to use a, multiple registers to engage with your topic. And so we were very careful, for instance, for ha to have any of the material relating to India to have it be, um, have been executed by Indian artists working in traditional forms. So for example, the events in India in the game are used, are um, resolved using a, a deck of these circular tiles which, if you're familiar with the history of Indian games, these are Ganjifa cards, which is an Indian trick-taking game. Uh, and we found an artist based in Mumbai who still works on these types of cards. This is a little close here. We'll back up just so you can kind of see them. Um, we had all of these commissioned. They were painted by hand. And on the back of them, they have the descriptions of the events that might happen uh, as, as the, the tiles are played. But it was important to have the primary engine of those events 
uh, be arrayed in this way. Now, in contrast, the art that concerns the Europeans, the Brits, we had to find the right register because this game is not kind to the British. Uh, these, the players do pretty evil things. But we had to find a way for the players to feel, at least for the purposes of the game, okay with their actions. I was okay with, I wanted players to feel bad after the game was over. But during the game, in order for the drama, you, if, you're, if you're staging Othello, you can't have Iago have a, have, a, have a crisis of confidence halfway through the show. You need him to be evil for the duration of the show. Um, so I needed to find a way to allow the players to engage with that. And we did this by using a lot of political cartoons and caricature. Because the thing about Brits, especially in the 18th century, is they loved making fun of how they looked. They were, they were ruthless. And so we used a lot of Rawlinson and Gilray illustrations to kind of draw out the grotesqueness of British society and have the players inhabit those. Now, that was actually uh, one thing, those little cameos we did at the start, uh, in early versions of them, we had very grotesque cameos that were actually putting off players. And so, okay, they got to dial it back just a little bit. Everyone should be like a step more handsome or pretty. Um, but when it came to the actual art of the game, we wanted to again use that period art. My favorite example of this is the Prime Minister Wheel. Which is probably, uh, which is probably buried. Uh, the game's politics are resolved using this kind of silly mini game uh, where the prime minister will choose different laws. Uh, and this is a little nod to Victorian games with, all, with all, often featured spinners. And so here's our Victorian spinner. And we had, uh, this is the original illustration. Um, and I had, I had one of our artists cut off his hand and make it look like he was pointing. Um, so, you know, some small liberties were, were taken. Now together, and actually if you could go to the slide of the whole game uh, out, what I hope you see now when you see the whole game in play are these different registers kind of overlaying. You can see, um, you know, the, the register of what we might think of as the game's UI, which is, you know, those 18th century tables laid out very cleanly. The game is set in an early cut of Baskerville. Uh, and then little glimpses of the comic of the grotesque. But then as your eye moves to India, uh, those are towers built around, uh, designed around some of the same uh, principles as the, as the towers of the Red Fort. There are metal flags, the large Ganjifa cards, showing India as for the for the purposes from the vantage point of the players as a kind of alien place, a place on the other side of the world. So we wanted that sense of distance, kind of all arrayed out, all arrayed out on the table. Yeah. And you also have this elephant. Yes. Also cast in rest. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> we need to show the elephant. Yeah. Yeah, the elephant, there's the elephant. He's in the, the bottom left where you can find him on, on camera. There he is, the, our little elephant. Uh, the elephant sculpted by um, Amarjeet Bitka, who also did uh, the sculpts for the towers. Wonderful. And I think one thing I'd like to make sure we talk about just before we go into questions is the board itself, which I think is a pretty masterful exercise in balancing aesthetics and information design. Thank you. <laughs> I did the graphic design. <laughs> That's a, well, for John Company, I did about half the graphic design, but it, um, okay. it took a, a lot of work. And I don't know if you have it on your slide, the, um, the, the different drafts of the board of this game. Yes. Um, I, well, I don't. I don't just... All right. We won't worry about it. So here, here we have the board. But I'll just say that the original first edition board had no map. It was a, a ribbon that looked like this that basically was... Just a visualization of turn action, essentially, mm -hmm. correct? Yep. Well, and I'll say something about the first edition of the game. So I mentioned that these games were built around German postage rates. The first edition of John Company had a board that was a little long, like about this large. And so when you're working on a boards, uh, every panel on the board can be the, up to the size of the box. So this is a six-fold board where the size of the fold is being determined by almost a U.S. letter sheet of paper. But if our board was only this tall, or our box was only this tall, let's say, then a four-fold board is only going to be about this large, which is how large the original board was. So there was just no room for a map of India. Now, this bothered me to no end because I would see people playing the game and folks would say, what is that game about? And someone's like, I don't know, some company. I'm like, no, it's about the East India Company. And so as we worked on the development of this game, uh, every iteration, the map of India got larger. Uh, and, and, and we had to stop doing it before India swallowed just about everything. Um, there you have it. Uh, and you also see some of the, this is uh, kind of uh, subdued here, but some of the Ganjifa art we have kind yes, of in, this, imprinted on the map of India as well. Yeah, so for instance, Mysore has the same bird illustration. Yep. 
All right. Excellent. I think now uh, it would be great to bring up questions now. How will we do questions? All right. So yeah, that one right there, over there. Hi. Uh, well, <laughs> um, you once a kind of tongue in cheek described Oath as a hate letter to legacy games. Um, how do you feel whether or not that particular goal was successful in changing uh, players? ideas surrounding permanence and change in, in a game. And uh, for a second question is, uh, you've stated a couple times that you're interested in uh, working on the uh, Southern Reconstruction as a uh, topic for a game, and I'm wondering how things are cooking on that. It's a hard question. Uh, so I'll take the first one first. So, and I'll give a word of context. Uh, legacy games are a movement of games that started in the late uh, 2010. Yeah, 2011. The, yeah, 2011. So the, the early 2010s, 20, around 2010. Uh, and they are built around the concept that the players will destroy and build their a game over the course of several games. That's a very bad way of describing it. Basically in a legacy game players at the end of every game will be prompted to change certain things about the game and will unlock different packets of content. Yeah, so now, this could involve like writing on a card, attaching a, card a sticker, ripping, yeah, ripping it in half, opening a packet that came with the game sealed yep. so you see what's inside of it. And the core problem with legacy games is I think that they are extremely narratively uh, curated. Uh, a legacy game knows everything it can do because it has this box of tricks. It's a little bit like a puzzle box. Uh, players can feel clever for solving it, but they don't, they're not participating in the act of storytelling. All the storytelling work has already been done. And Oath is, is a direct reaction to that because Oath basically says, we don't know how you're going to use this box to tell stories. And the box doesn't know, but you might know, and you're gonna slowly figure it out. And I think for the players who have played a lot of Oath, it has worked. Uh, everyone, you know, Oath players, when I'm at conventions and, and folks come up to me who, who play Oath, the Oath fans are the loudest. They're the ones who are most excited to talk about what's happening in their game. And I love signing uh, a journal where, that someone has filled, where they filled all 100 pages with 100 generations of Oath. Someone told me once that they felt like their game of Oath really opened up after the 20th game. Uh, it really started, it really started coming alive. Um, and, but I also think that that was, that's a lot of investment. And, and, I, and I can understand, I think that Oath, in some respects, didn't go far enough. And uh, a game I'm working on right now that I'm in the final steps of completing called Arcs is an effort to do more dramatic storytelling work on a shorter format. Arcs is built around the kind of concept of, of trilogies. And so it's a campaign game, but it always takes three games to sort of play through one full game of Arcs. Um, but it is infinitely resettable and replayable. So you can always rewind it back and play a different trilogy out of it. Uh, and I'm hoping that that helps players who want to explore the, this territory, but you know, maybe don't have, don't have space. Now for the second question, you asked if I've made any progress on my game about reconstruction. And the answer is yes. The problem with reconstruction is, ugh, it's such a, it's a, the problem with reconstruction is the problem with reconstruction. It is an impossible topic. Because uh, when you are working on a game, the most important decision you have to make is one of framing. What is the game essentially about? John Company looks at the East India Company from the perspective of families. Oath is a game about how things are remembered. Pamir is a game about eight, uh, 19th century Afghanistan, but is primarily about how states emerge in the imperial periphery. So they have these anchors. And when you're working on a history game, there's really just two questions you need to ask. The first question is, who are the people exercising agency? Those are probably your players. And the second question is, what did they care about? And that's probably your victory condition. But those are both deeply, deeply fraught questions when it comes to the subject of reconstruction. And so trying to figure out precisely the right framing to tell the story of a quasi-successful but also a massive failure of nation building that occurs within the United States is a vexed subject. And so I have... 
a few, what, what has happened is instead of it becoming one project, it's become a series of projects, each of which has as many liabilities as the others, but fixes other problems. So I have a version of it that fundamentally uses a counterinsurgency framework, um, and it thinks about it fundamentally as a nation-building problem. I have a version of it that thinks about it primarily as a political problem, and I have another version of it that looks at it primarily as a revolutionary problem. And neither one of those framings feels adequate, and so I don't know if it will ever be one game or it might become a, a sequence. But it's still in progress, and it's still I still don't know when it will be done. But thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> um, there's a yeah. yeah. Um, I, oh, there's a mic coming too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about storytelling through sourced historical art versus storytelling through commissioned art and how that sort of affects the design of your game if you're wanting to tell these histor historical stories and using contextual art versus an imagined realm that can have art that looks like anything you want. So... It's a, it's a great question, and I'm, I'll answer it by uh, talking about a game that we did not talk about here on the table, so I'm going to cheat a little bit. Uh, the game that my brother and I are working on right now with a, a designer based in Bristol named Joe Kelly is called Molly House, which is about um, queer communities in 1720s London. Now, we know a lot about queer communities in 1720s London, which is a bit of a strange thing, uh, and we, we know that because of the way they were informed upon and revealed in the, the records of the Old Bailey. But we don't have a lot of images. Uh, the images that we do have are deeply upsetting. They're not images by that community for the community. They're images that were fundamentally about undermining that community. So when it came to illustrate that game, we didn't have access to period art. Uh, it didn't feel right to use period art for those ends. And so what we've done is we have found an artist, um, Rachel Ford, who works in 18th century style illustration and we are deeply sourcing a kind of imagined approach that asks if these if someone had done you know if hogarth had painted these scenes of a of a gin christening in a molly house what would it have looked like could we capture that we want to kind of elevate it to the same seriousness and humanity that those get uh because like games themselves um the choice of a subject for an illustration is fundamentally about empathy and an empathy strategy. And when we're working with uh, populations that aren't reflected in the visual record, we have to do our best to kind of create those, th those archives. Now, with, with the game about Afghanistan, um, Pamir actually uh, had to make a really difficult choice in the matter because the visual record of 19th century Afghanistan uh, is robust but does not include things that we might call character art, just because that tradition uh, behaves very differently in, in, the, in the context of, you know, uh, tribal politics. These aren't folks who were like having their, their portraits done. Um, so what we ended up using are the illustrations of, of Atkinson and Rattray, which are two painters who were working or who were just kind of stationed um, along with the Anglo, um, along with the army in the Anglo-Afghan war. And I'm, I was a little hesitant to use their illustrations initially. But as I started learning more about them, um, they're tremendously humane illustrations. They're, like, they're coming at a period before some of the nastier caricature tendencies in British imperial art. And there's a real effort to venerate and understand a culture that's not their own. And I thought that it, tr it captured the fact that in my own background, I'm approaching this subject fundamentally as an outsider. And so I liked using the art because I thought there was a lot of uh, good intent and it seemed like it, it harmonized with, with the work of, of the game. But when it came to the actual physical materials of, of play, that wasn't good enough, which is why we found ourselves trying to use the, the materials that would make sense within the, the uh, aesthetic framework that the players are actually inhabiting in the game. It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, all the way in the bag. Right there in the middle. Um, with the release of John Company and Pax Premier Second Editions, and then now with the early photos we have of what Molly House is probably going to look like, we can sort of see the the emergence of the whirly gig aesthetic because those three games next to each other on a table would not look out of place with one another. 
Um, but as far as the physical components and the design are concerned, you know, you talked about like the resin makeup of the pieces for Pax Pamir. How much of the specifics of those ideas is coming from you? And then specifically with something like Molly House, where you're collaborating with Joe Kelly, what is it, what is it like having those specific ideas, assuming that they're coming from you, mm -hmm. when you are collaborating with a different designer who would theoretically be the primary driver of that project? Well, I'll give you an example when it comes to Molly House. So we... At some point in the prototyping of Molly House, we needed figurines for, for players. And we didn't know what we needed player pieces. Now, John Company uses wooden pawns that look a little bit like the pieces in, in, in Sari. They're very traditional pawns, which, which is to say a big head with a kind of narrow stem and then a, a round base. Um, I really like these pawns because they're a little old fashioned. And in, 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 in John Company, they are used for various trackers. And so when we were first playing Molly House, we just used pawns. And they worked fine. And at one point, my, my brother, we were, at, um, we were at the British Museum, and we were looking at figurines from the 18th century. And we thought, I wonder if we, we could, should use figurines for, for Molly House. And so we, we bought some very silly, like, wargaming, I think they were called, like, you know, pub characters from the 18th century that were, you know, probably 10 pounds or something, a little set of these metal figurines that are all drunkards and things. And... We decided to use those for a game of Molly House. Slightly in jest, but also just to see what the play experience was like. And we found that players gravitated towards them. They, it was part of the, the fun of pretend. Now, as we worked on those miniatures, um, we brought the aesthetic strategy to, to Joe. And I consider Joe, uh, we are co-designers on Molly House, but I, Joe has every executive authority on that game. I, Joe knows a lot more about the period than I do. And my goal is to help Joe realize their vision for the game. And so I like working with Joe because even though it's their first game and my you know, eighth or something, I get to be the understudy and say, oh, is this good enough for you? And I presented them with the figurines and they thought, well, these are horrible. Uh, I, I hate them because they seem too fixed. Like what if a player doesn't see themselves in that, in that figurine, which I thought was a very reasonable approach. And we, we went back and forth on the, the design of the metal figurines. And one thing that we ran into is um, a lot of the initial sculpts were designed using contemporary, uh, well, they were using period poses, but they were very dramatic poses, very three-dimensional poses, which is good miniature design. Except if you've ever seen miniatures cast in the 18th century, you're not going to see kind of a three-dimensional pose. There's going to be a lot of like very flat pose work. So we had all of the miniatures repost. Um, to be flatter, and also to be a little bit more anonymous. And this, too, potentially did not quite seem, seem right. We had a version where the, the players, we kind of went back to the classic pawn, pawns, but we said, what if we gave them little rubber wigs? It's a little fun, and then they kind of look like little characters. We could, you could pick your wig. I mean, the game's about dress-up. It, like, it seems important that we have this kind of play. And after we, we, we played with it, and we all had kind of a laugh at it, and I, and I said, Joe, I think... Is this too cartoonish? I think we're I think we're trivializing things now, and and we all agreed that that was the case. And we thought, well, maybe we shouldn't be thinking about figurines at all, but instead statuary. And so our current strategy for the metal pieces is potentially to design them like little busts uh, on on kind of pedestals, which allows us to spend more time on the faces and less time on the full body shape, and and also to kind of elevate the subject material because these would be. In a more just world, there would be a statue of Princess Serafina in Holborn, but there isn't. And in the in the game, we can you, we can kind of create the, these spaces. So that that's the current strategy, and this is this is all a work in progress. You know, we haven't even written kind of the update and description of this. It'll probably I'll probably write it next week, and we're waiting on some concept art from the art, artist before we even push kind of the next the next big update. And one of the things I love about using crowdfunding is that when we work on a game, it's a real dialogue with the players who are helping fund the game so that we can show them our work in progress and we can have them react to what we're doing. And we don't always, I don't think of it so much as we are trying to get approval for them, but I, I like to think about, um, I, I want them in the room and for them to understand that, you know, it's their dollars that are making these games possible. And so they have kind of a right to know our thinking. Do we have one more question? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I guess, yes, thank you so much for <laughs> Paul, Paul Worley.
And thank you all for coming. Thank you.